the history of the music industry. And this is very important because I talk to a lot of people who are in the business. I talk to A&Rs, I talk to managers, I talk to artists, and I ask them, why are you in this? Why are you in this business? Now, something very interesting. Sometimes artists will say things to me like, I was born for success. I was born for the music industry. Now, after I tell you the history of the music industry, I want to see if you say that same thing at the end of this course. So let's get started on the music industry and how it became this. So a lot of people don't realize this, but one of the reasons why we're in the music industry is because of sugar. I'll say it again. We're in this industry because of sugar. Now, how does that work? How does that correlate? So back at the end of the 1500s, there were zero pounds of sugar eaten per year by an average person. So zero pounds were eaten per year by an average person in the 1500s. Now in the UK, sugar was at prohibition prices, meaning it was illegal in a sense, in theory, because it was so hard to find. So whenever you found it, it was called white gold. So they considered sugar to be such an expensive commodity because it was hard to find and it was only used by delicacies and chefs. So when it was like a very famous chef, he'd sprinkle some sugar on it. Or it was used by witch doctors doing love potions. So it tastes a little sweet and they put sugar in it. So during this time, around the 1500s, is when people started to become entrepreneurs, where conquistadors and people who were travelers wanted to find new trade routes in the, the world so they can trade spices and commodities and silks and all kinds of things, right? So people like Christopher Columbus would go to Ferdinand and Isabella and ask for money in exchange for a part of the things that they would collect on these extravagant traveling expeditions, right? So they would say, I would like five ships and I'd like, you know, $100,000 in gold or something and I'm going to get all these people to work on the ships with me and we're going to find a new trade route and from the things that we find that trade route, we will give it back to the people who invested the money. So these were the first entrepreneurs. It was going to a king or queen, asking for an investment, and from that investment they would use it to buy ships and buy boats and then get land. Okay. So what happened was during the 1600s, the East India Company, which is where the Britain actually owned a portion of India, they realized that there were sugarcane fields in this territory. Now sugarcane, like I said, was so expensive. The only problem was a lot of these fields were malaria infested with mosquitoes. So the people who lived there didn't want to work these fields and the Britons didn't want to work these fields because they might die from malaria. So what they started to do was go to places like New Guinea, like Ghana and like in the Caribbean and they would take slaves. And from these slaves, they'd bring them over to America. So the first group of slaves were taken from their home country where they only spoke that language and they were brought to America in 1619. So in 1619, they landed in Jamestown, Virginia. So let's imagine that. Let's imagine someone comes to your town and they take you. They take your mother, they take your father, and they take you from the place that you know, all your friends and family, and they put you into another country on the other side of the world and they force you to work. Let's really imagine that. Imagine being in a field at four o'clock in the morning, which is when they started, till seven o'clock at night, and you were told, if you don't work this field for tobacco, for cotton, or for sugar, then we're gonna whip you. We're gonna chain you up. See that dog behind me? That dog's gonna bite you. See that, that hose? We're gonna put that hose on you. Imagine the pain that these people went through. So let's go into it. It's four o'clock in the morning, and you're working on the fields, and you're going through pain. Now remember, when you go through pain, sometimes you make sounds. You make grunts, you make noises. So let's imagine me hitting a sledgehammer against a rock, or let's imagine me digging holes, or imagine me picking cotton. And in that, I might go through some pain because it's long days, and I might let out a sound that goes, whoa, 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 and you can hear that resonating throughout the fields. And then maybe my sister hears me and she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because remember, there's no words yet. It's just dialect and sounds. The African dialect was a dibba da baba da biba da da. It's very syncopated. Remember? Have you ever seen people from the bush speak in Africa? It's very syncopated and has rhythms and sounds and inflections that change what the meanings of words are. So I might be in the field going, whoa, and my sister hears me and she goes, yeah, 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 yeah. And someone else is like, that's when the first scatting started. That's when the first harmonizing started. And if any of you have ever sang in choir, you know that when two people sing, there becomes like this weird energy glue where you're like connected to them from the harmony. So this was happening amongst the fields before the language of Americans were taught to these African slaves. So years go by and years go by. And now let's take the moment to understand these slaves were trying to find a way to cope with the pain they were going through. And so they came out through song. It came out through creative endeavors because they didn't have anything else to do. There was no Netflix. There was no YouTube. There was no time killers. The only thing you could do was make music and try to be, spend time with your family and not get hurt or killed. This is what the reality was at that time point. Also at that same time point, there was another minority group that came to America. 
and those were the Jews. The Jews were escaping a dictatorship rule in Brazil, and they landed in New Amsterdam, which is now called New York, in around 1645. So we're gonna put a pin in the Jews for a second because the Jews are also a major important part of the music industry and in business in general in America. So we have these two minority groups, black African slaves and Jews, okay? So now, 1600s, 1700s, people are starting to learn some of the words that the slave masses are using, right? Yes massa, no massa, things like that. Small words, because it's not a big dialect yet. And also, if you were caught reading as a slave, you could be killed. So you didn't want anyone to know that you knew how to read because then you might be hurt or your family members might be hurt. So you would keep the fact that you might be learning how to read very on the low key. So what would happen is certain times in the night, there'd be moments where all of a sudden the slave master was going to bed and in the distance he would hear, dum, du, du, dum, dum, du, du, dum, dum. He'd like check outside the window, look out, doesn't see anything going on, goes back to bed, dum, du, du, dum, dum, du, du, dum, dum. He goes to sleep. Next morning he wakes up and he walks out to the fields and he notices there's a bunch of slaves gone. Half of his slaves are gone. So he goes to the market and he sees his friend Jim and he's like, hey Jim, if you happen to see my slaves, I want you to beat them, whip them, and bring them back. And Jim goes, you know what's funny you said that? If you happen to see my slaves, I want you to beat them, whip them, and bring them back. So the two have a conversation and they're like, what did you hear last night? What happened last night? And they start realizing they both are the same. Doom, do, do, doom, doom, do, do, doom, doom. And in that moment, they realized the African drum was being used to signal something. So they find out that the African drum was not just used in festivities, like just parties and then dancing around. The African drum was used as a Morse code in order to signal escape and to start wars, start fights. So when they were using the African drum to tell all the other slaves, we're getting out tonight. This is when we're going to run away, right? So the minute they found that out, the African drum was banned in America. A lot of people don't know that. So what slaves did, and they thought, okay, well, we can't use the drum, well, what can we use? So what they started saying was they looked around the slave owners and they realized all the instruments that the slave owners were using were stringed instruments, pianos, guitars, uh, cellos, violins, fiddles, all stringed instruments. And so the slaves thought, all right, well, we can take the skin from the drum, you know, the top that looks like a congo or a bongo, that skin, we can take that and we can put it with a stringed instrument like the masters have, and they created the banjo. The African slaves were the first people to create an invention called the banjo. And if you listen to the banjo, it's very syncopated, just like the dialect would have been. Bing, da bing, da bing, da bing, bing, bing. Very syncopation, right? So now slaves started to make their own instruments. They would take the bones from pigs and from chickens and put them together on a string, and that became shakers. And they put them around their ankles, they put them around their wrists, and that became rhythm. And they would use this while they would dance, and they'd use the banjo, and they'd use that as a core instrument. So I want you to imagine what this would be like when you start to make your own way in this world, but you're not allowed to do certain things because you are a slave. But then at this point around 1863, there was a major war in America. It was called the Civil War. And so when basically two sides of America were fighting about slavery, one side said, we think it's horribly wrong to enslave people and beat them and tell them to work your fields. The other side said, we see nothing wrong with this. And a lot of people don't realize this, but one million people died in that theory of conflict. The theory of saying, it's not right to enslave a human being. That shouldn't even be a thought. It's just wrong. But at that time period, people were willing to fight for it. And a million people died off of that thought for the fight. So 1865 comes around and slaves are now free. But just because they're free of being enslaved does not mean they're free from the society and the mindset of slavery. So let's say you are a 16 year old black girl and you happen to be free now and you try to walk into the diner and you go, whoa, 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 you're not allowed here. They're like, okay, you try to walk in to get, drink some water. You try to walk into the park and they're like, well, no, 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 black people can't step foot on this grass. This is white grass only. And then you're like, okay, let me go into that, that place over there where I can drink some water. No, 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 no. This is where whites drink and that's where colors drink. So everything was still segregated. You couldn't even learn in school. So you weren't able to go into the same school systems, get the same knowledge because of your color. So slavery had ended, but not the thought of slavery, not the thought of segregation. It's still happening today. So during this time point, there were certain slaves that were, let's say, attractive, and they were brought in as house slaves. A lot of people have heard this before. And those house slaves would be used for cooks and for sex, and they'd be used for uh, taking care of the children. So let's say a slave master brought in one of the pretty slaves that he would call, and that was a person he slept with every night. So eventually, the hard part about it is that this woman didn't want to sleep with this guy, but it was better than working the fields. So eventually, she just got used to it. And she notices that every night before she goes to bed, 
on the slave master's countertop was a book, right? Now they have this big shelf in front of her that every night those books stay on the shelf. But for some reason there's this one book that he always goes to sleep and he always reads that one before he goes to sleep. So just normal deduction tells her this book is more important than those books. Pretty simple, right? So how does she get her hands on that book? She waits for the master to go to sleep. She grabs the book. She tosses out the window. And her cousin catches it and runs it to the shelter. And he goes in there and he starts to read it and shows everyone else how to read it. Now, hopefully some of you might know what this book might be by this point. But if you don't know, it's the Bible. So when these slaves grab this book and they start reading words of redemption, of, of getting out of slavery, of rising above, having faith, you know, these are very important words to someone who just learned the language. So when they start singing, all of a sudden the dialect and the harmonies and the emotion and the power, right, the rage of being enslaved, comes out with these words like, O Lord, O to the mountaintops. So you see what I'm saying? See how the gospel grew? And this is where gospel music started. A lot of people don't know this. It's from the pain, it's through the struggle, it's from the pressure. Now look at the time. I want you to imagine the amount of time it takes to build a muscle. The amount of time it takes to build muscle memory, right? So if you're a 10-year-old child and you've been singing six hours a day, every day, to the time you're 20, you would have amassed over 20,000 hours of time. That 20,000 hours is building a muscle that is undeniable. So when you sing in public, you're gonna blow everyone else away because you've been doing it through pain. You've been singing for God. You've been pushing yourself through real struggle. And that's why your voice is an instrument that has true power. So today, people do singing lessons, they do all kinds of stuff, but they're not putting in six hours a day through pain and struggle and for a bigger concept. They're just singing because they enjoy to sing. It's a whole different ball game. So now the slaves have this book, they have this knowledge, they have this information, and they're singing behind it with power and within force. Well, that's how the gospel started. So now you're 16 years old, it's uh, 1880, and you can't do anything in white public society. But you know what you can build really quickly with about 20 people? A church. A church can be made very simply back in the day. It's just a bunch of wood under a construct. And it's a place of safety, a place, a place of congregation, a place where everyone who's going through the same struggles can come to and voice their opinions together in a unified front. So if you're singing every day with your cousins and your brothers and you're playing music every day, you're going to become incredibly good and not know how good you actually are because there's no competition yet. See, now we live in a day where we can see the competition on Instagram and on YouTube. Back in the day, you didn't even know who was singing out there because there wasn't ways to find out. Until 1890, Thomas Edison created the phonograph. A lot of you might know the phonograph from seeing the Grammys. That's where the phonograph would be. But these phonographs were very bulky and big, and they couldn't be sold everywhere because they were really expensive. But it was the first time that you can capture live audio and put it onto a vinyl recording and be able to pass that recording around as records. So over time, the phonograph became smaller and smaller and smaller and became the record player. So now, 1920 and 1930, we have some of the biggest technological advances of all time, of mass communication. We have the radio station and the TV station in the same 10 years. Really think about this. America has created two of the biggest mass communication outlets in the same decade. Not also did we do that, we also created the internet. So we control all of the mass communication all of the world. So it's not that we're the best at creating TV shows or creating music, it's just that we were the first. And because we were the first, people tried to copy that for their format. Notice how they say format, same thing on your memory cards, you format something, it's when you clean slate it and then start new by adding new information. That's formatting, right? So that's why they call it radio formats and TV formats. These are formats that are controlled and that other people then copy. So check this out. We have 1920, 1930s, you would have been a kid singing a song and all of a sudden, it's been recorded by someone who had a record player or a phonograph. And then, without you knowing it, it was put on local radio. And then, because it's on local radio, it spread out to a couple different counties. But you were a young black girl, and you didn't know anything about money. And you didn't know anything about touring. You didn't know anything about a business, because it just kind of started. So now people in other towns are saying, we want to book you. We want to book you. We want to put you in our shows. We want to get you to play where we are. Now, this is very important, because a lot of people say they want managers. Now input the Jews. So at this point, Jewish people have realized in order not to be enslaved, you have to have as much money as the slave owners. Because if you have as much money as them, they can't enslave you. So Jews taught their children business. Okay? And the reason why I talk about this openly is because I'm half Jewish and half black. And I have two separate sides of my family. And they both work completely differently. They have both different mindsets based on what they've been taught from their relatives and their elders. And I see it on both sides. I get to study it all. So at this point in history, when Jews met someone who was a very talented black singer, 
I want you to think about what that would be like to first hear white singers at the time who were singing, you know, in their version, you know, on the prairie, in the mountains, over fields, you know, that's cute. And then all of a sudden you hear a black girl, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, different kind of energy, different kind of thing coming at the airwaves. And it would make people react. Remember I said reactive records, reactive music. People start reacting. What is this black music? What is this soul music? We don't know what it is, but we like it because it's infusing adrenaline into us, right? So they can feel it. So now, all of a sudden, you're this 18-year-old girl and your song's being played on different places. You don't know how to make money. You don't know anything. So the Jews said, hey, wait a second. Let me show you how to do business. I can walk into that club. I can walk into that bar because I have the same skin tone, but I can talk to the owner where you can't. All good. I'll help you out. Do you know anything about business? And the girl would say, no. Okay, well, I'll teach you business. I'll organize your schedule. Do you know how to read and write? Not really. Okay, I can read and write. I can show you how to do all this stuff. So managers did organization. They did networking. They did business control of finances. And they helped doing your booking, things like that, right? Things that blacks at the time could not physically do. This is so important to why people say they need managers today and they don't know why managers even started. Management was to help people at the time who couldn't do something. But now you can book on your own. Now you can do organization on your own. Now you can have your own calendar and you can read and write and you can learn how to invest and save. Things that people didn't know how to do back in the day. Let's say an average girl got paid $2 for a show. She went back to her parents and said, hey parents, what should I do with this $2? You know what the black parents would say? I don't know. I've never seen money before. I can't tell you what to do. So what would they do? They would go do what they see white people doing, buying shoes, buying dresses. They just repeat what they saw because they weren't taught to save and invest. It's so important because if you look at the way our industry is now, you'll see people who are rappers who get deals and the first thing they do is put on a chain. First thing they do is show their gold off because we weren't taught how to invest and how to save money. But I guarantee you this, you're never going to see Jeff Bezos, who's a billionaire, wearing a gold chain. When you really have money at that level, you don't have to show it off. And that's something that you would know if you were taught business, but a lot of us just weren't. So 1920s, 1930s, artists are starting to emerge on radio and on TV. And a lot of this was causing reaction out there, especially between whites and blacks. So there was a tour called the Chitlin Circuit. If anyone knows what chitlins are, it's the part of the pig that's the intestines. Now the intestines were fed to slaves instead of the ham and the actual meat from the pig. They would just give the, the slaves intestines and, and eventually slaves started learning how to cook it up really good and they called it chitlins. So there was a tour that started called the Chitlin Circuit. Now for everyone out there who really knows music history, who knows some of the great musicians of that time, when you walked into the bus, let's say you're going on the Chitlin circuit, you walk the steps of the bus, you look at the crowd, you realize that all these, each bus has different seats, and let me show you the people who are in those seats. James Brown, Sam Cooke, Donny Hathaway, Shaka Khan, The Temptations, Stevie Wonder. You see in the level of talent all on one school bus? And more importantly, one school bus that was going on tour into towns where people wanted to kill them. Think about how, how connected you all would be as a family if you want to make music as joy, but you have to go into a town of people who want to kill you, people who have others hang up by nooses when you walk in, who have signs that say, get out of here, we don't want coloreds here. You're going to get really connected with the people that you're with, and you're also going to learn how to, how to absorb the things that they're doing musically. So you're sharing your ideas and your concepts. Now, unfortunately, in the 1930s in America, 1940s, there's also another major outbreak that people don't talk about which is the heroin outbreak, right? So in America, we had two major outbreaks of heroin, 1930s and 40s and 1960s. So this time point, imagine Ray Charles, a man who was going through a lot of pain, or imagine some of these artists who were going through a lot of pain, and they were trying to get their pain out, and someone goes, I got something that takes away your pain. There's no scientific studies on it. We don't know what happens, but you should probably try it. At that point, you're like, okay, I'll give it a shot. And that's unfortunately why some of the best musicians of that time were addicts their whole life. We have people who were some of the biggest musicians of all time were addicts because heroin is one of the most potent drugs there are and one of the most addictive. You take one shot of heroin, sometimes people get addicted for life. So this was happening in a major way during this time point and no one really knew much about it because it was such a new drug. Now on the Chitlin circuit, we have people going from town to town really building this massive buzz throughout society. And this is really tricky for people because imagine this, you have all of a sudden people who were slaves you know, 50, 60 years ago and now all of a sudden when they sing, people want to look up to them. And that's never happened in this country. So now there's a black man who was considered a slave not too long ago, who now when he gets up and sing, white women want to sleep with him. Whoa, big deal. Really big deal when all of a sudden there's a person who used to be looked at as under, but yet the women want to sleep with them. 
that caused a major rift, a lot of tensions, because all of a sudden, power was switching in the undertone of our animalistic DNA, of like procreation. Very big deal, especially in American society. So, this tour keeps going around, it starts to amass a lot of buzz, we're selling records, people are building money now, people are becoming famous because it's spreading around the world because as more advancements come with radio stations, TV stations, now it's being put on different countries, and now an artist could have been you know, broke at one point, and now they have millions of dollars, but they still don't know how to invest and save their money. So they keep having management do it, and right? this is part of how the business works. So now 1960s come along, 1970s comes along, we're building more money, we're building more money, and then 1999 comes around. 1999 is where the highest point in the music industry was, where the very top point, where some artists were selling 50 million albums. I think Backstreet Boys sold 50 million albums collectively. The Last More Set sold 20 million albums collectively. That's a lot of money. Back in the day, it was $20 an album. And you sold 20 million albums? That's a lot of money. It's like half a billion dollars. But nowadays, the biggest three records from last year were George Ezra, around 3 million, um, Star is Born, around 3 million, The Greatest Showman, around 3 million. But back in the day, an artist can sell 20 million on their own. The difference in money has changed the game. And unfortunately, in 1999, Napster happened. And once Napster happened, the whole industry crashed because now people were able to illegally steal songs. So what once used to be a very flourishing, very thriving industry has now been combated by people being online pirates. That's really what it is. They're stealing things online, just like piracy would have been if someone caught you on the seas and you happen to have some kind of supply they wanted to just take it. That's what's happening now. So the industry started taking a nosedive. Now we're starting to come back with streaming and we're starting to make different amendments to these things, different laws, but it's very important that you understand the reason why you're here is not because you were born to be famous. The reason why you're here was not because success is just guaranteed for you. The reason why you're here is because there was a huge rush in sugar because by the end of this time that I was talking about, the sugar rush went from zero pounds of sugar in the UK to 18.9 pounds of sugar a year per person because all of a sudden people wanted Swiss chocolates and they wanted brownies and they wanted cakes. And as that amassed and as that grew and as people wanted more sugar and become more addicted to the sugar, we kept on getting more slaves and more slaves and started amassing it. Same thing with tobacco, highly addictive. Tobacco, sugar, cotton, clothing. It started to build up these industries. So the more slaves, the more business. And this is how the music industry was actually started. We are here in direct reflection from people having certain needs from textile industries, from food industries, using slaves to bring them into America and different parts of the world to amass, in a sense, a large industry, but through that was a lot of pain, a lot of struggle. And then because of that, people became ridiculously talented from many, many years of putting in their time and energy for a thing that was just their only release of pain, not because they thought they would become famous, not because of money, not for anything else, but the love of music because they had to do it to let out their stresses. If you can understand that one simple fact, that the reason why you're here is maybe to get out your own stresses and connect with people, or that you have the opportunity to connect with others through this music, and not that you're just born for it, then maybe you'll take the moment to really invest in making sure that you become the best you can be, and not just good enough to keep going forward.